So I have been working on electronic and internet voting since about uh, 2000 and not, uh, sorry, 1999, so uh, a dozen years anyway. Um, I'm here from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, but uh, this work doesn't, this is not what I do at the laboratory. Um, I do supercomputing simulations there. Um, however, I have this side interest which the laboratory allows me to pursue in uh, election security because it's part of U.S. national security and, and a major cybersecurity issue. So um, let's see. So first I want to make the point that, uh, of course, voting in a democracy is, is a matter of national security. The legitimacy of government at all levels depends on free and fair and accurate and open and transparent elections. And so we have to consider this as of the highest security issue. This, we're not talking e-commerce security here. This has to be considered a national security issue. Here's what I'm going to be talking about today. First of all, I'm going to be talking about what's so complicated about voting and elections. Most people think that it's, that it's got to be simple. All you have to do is gather all the votes from the clients to the server, sum up all the ones and zeros, decide which, you know, which candidate has the largest number of votes, declare the winner, you're done. Uh, that's about 1% of the task. I'll show you what the other 99% is. And then I'm going to talk about a little bit about how electronic precinct voting is done and give you some horror stories about that because the theme here is going to be that all electronic uh, voting of any kind, internet or precinct based, is a bad idea. We need something stronger than the capabilities of all electronic voting. I'm then going to talk about a key requirement that has been uh, identified in the last few years called auditability of electronic voting um, and why it's important. Um, then I'm going to talk about internet voting and explain to you the additional layer of uh, complex security problems that arise there. Um, and then I'm going to tell you um, the most recent and most fascinating horror story about internet voting that uh, just occurred last October. So, first of all, why is voting so complicated? Again, most people think of it as a relatively simple application. It's a distributed application in which the votes are collected at precincts or various other sites, uh, funneled into a county uh, central location where the votes are just uh, counted and summed, and uh, that's, that's all it appears to be. But in fact, there are a whole host of technical requirements that are associated with elections, and I'm going to go through these somewhat quickly because it's not the main part of the talk, but just to give you an idea of the complexity. Um, so uh, first we have to be concerned with voter authentication because all eligible voters should be allowed to vote, but people who are not eligible to vote should not be. Uh, ballot selection means that voters have to get the correct ballot, that is to say the things and people that they are allowed to vote for in their uh, jurisdiction, they are, they're shown on their ballot and the things they're not allowed to vote for are not on their ballot. Of course, people are in multiple vote prevention, you're not allowed to vote twice in any given election. Uh, accuracy of capture, that is to say the voter's intent from his head to the digital form of the ballot, however that happens, has to be done accurately. Um, ballot integrity, that is to say throughout the process end to end, ballots cannot be lost nor corrupted, nor phony ballots inserted into the process anywhere. Accuracy of tally, of course, the votes have to be uh, summed and, and uh, reported uh, uh, and counted accurately according to law. You would think this is easy, but I'm going to show you an example where that failed. Uh, there are two kinds of privacy issues involved. Um, privacy one is that it should not be possible if you, if you get your hands on a ballot, you're a county official, to figure out who cast that vote. And privacy, too, is the voter also, although he knows how he voted, and the voter is free to tell anybody how he voted, the voter is not free to have any proof of how he voted. It's very important that he not be able to prove it, because if he could prove it, he could be coerced, or he could sell the vote. That's a very tricky security uh, issue there. You can tell anybody how you vote, but you're not allowed to be able to prove it. More on that later. Um, there are many kinds of ballots. An ordinary voting, uh, I mean, a, a countywide voting system has to handle all of these different kinds of ballots simultaneously and without loss of privacy of any of the categories of voters. System certification. 
A county voting system, all parts of the software, has to go through a certification process in all 50 states, and most of them recognize voluntarily a federal certification process, and we'll come to later, which is to say that the software has to meet certain standards and has to be tested to meet those standards. Uh, I have to, my opinion is that these standards are relatively weak, and the testing is relatively weak, and this is not a, a high barrier, but it's still required. Um, and it's a model of the way they think about security in the elections world. The software integrity issue, the object code uh, derived for, must, that, that is run on uh, the voting machines in the precincts and uh, on the county election servers, that object code better be derived from the certified source code and distributed without modification. In other words, nobody should be tampering with that code. Um, availability, the, uh, the voting system must be up for at least all of election day and any other time that is required by law. Reliability, all these properties the voting system should have even in the face of partial failures of the voting system. Security, it should have all these other properties even in the face of at least a certain amount of deliberate uh, uh, conspiracy of election officials, programmers, or others to undermine the election. Obviously, it's not going to be possible if there's a large conspiracy involved, but at least, you know, single uh, points of failure uh, of, of insecurity you want, you want it to, uh, to not have. Transparency. Now, this is uh, – transparency means that the entire system is end-to-end -end simple enough that ordinary citizens can understand it so they can have confidence the election is called correctly and also that it's observable enough that the citizens have a right to follow the, the votes and the ballots from the moment they're cast to the moment they're counted, they're counted and, and check the results. This is not uh, a, a, an operation that is supposed to be done uh, black box. This, is, this balances um, with the security issue. This is one of the things that makes election security so much more difficult than in other security problems because of the requirement that it be observable by ordinary citizens from end to end. Learnability. The human interface on voting machines has to be cognitively simple enough so that somebody who has never voted on that machine or hasn't voted on it in the last two years can come up to it and use it immediately and learn it as he goes. This turns out to have been a major problem that I think caused a, a, a congressional race to swing the wrong way, as I will describe you later, in 2006. Verifiability. Each voter wants to be able to verify that his own vote was captured correctly. Not so much a problem when you vote in a precinct. A serious problem, though, if you vote remotely, either by mail or, God forbid, by Internet. Uh, auditability. The system should produce... Uh, a a tamper-resistant independent record or audit trail that can be the basis of an audit of the, uh, the software in the system. In other words, that, that, that all these other properties have, have happened. The problem is, of course, you, can't, you really can't verify that the software does its job, and when something as important as the outcome of an election is at stake, you need another way of being sure that the, that, uh, the system worked besides trusting software. Manageability, the system has to be administered by citizens in their 70s. That's the average age of a poll worker in the United States. Accessibility to disabled voters. Mission criticality, the election has to happen on time and the day defined by law, no second chances. And finally, speed. The public has a, an insatiable demand for fast results from an election once the election day is over. and. Uh, and that, of course, undercuts all of the other <laughs> requirements that we have. So um, I make no claim that these, all of these requirements are fully consistent, and they are certainly uh, much more complex than most people understand. Yes? Yeah. You're absolutely right. That's one of the difficult contradictions to resolve. It, it does that. And so, in fact, absentee ballots, when you are allowed to verify that your ballot w was, was cast, or for that matter, even if you're not, um, there's very little th to prevent you from selling an absentee ballot, even today, a paper absentee ballot. So, again, contradictory requirements. Okay. 
Now, I want to talk a little about precinct uh, electronic voting before I get to Internet voting. Um, by electronic voting, I mean when the, the voting machines on which you cast your ballot are, in effect, are, are computers running software, and they don't have any paper record associated with them. In other words, the ballots are cast all electronically. Uh, those machines are called uh, DRE machines, direct recording electronic machines. They usually have touchscreen interfaces, but not all. Here are three different uh, brands of them that are in use in the United States. Um, the Diebold machines, the ENS, ESNS machines, and the Hart machines. Uh, two of these are in use in California. Um, DREs and electronic voting became a, a kind of national priority or fad, depending upon how you look at it, after the uh, infamous 2000 uh, election in Florida with its hanging chads and stuff. The vision of electronic voting that uh, was that the vendors who sold the idea believed and that the election officials who bought it believed, and they honestly believed it, um, is that it would, uh, first of all, allow votes to be captured straight from the voter's head into digital form without going through some ambiguous form that might be quasi-digital, like either marks on paper or partial punches in a punch card, that, that the election would be administered in a clean, reliable, efficient, secure, and paperless way, um, the results would be uncontestable. There would be overvote protection, which is to say if you vote for two separate, for two candidates for the same race, uh, you'd be told you can't do that. Nothing in the punch card world prevents you from punching two, hards, two cards, but in the, in the electronic voting world, you can be, you can be given an error indication. Uh, that voting could be made much more accessible uh, to, the, to the disabled, especially the blind, with computer interfaces. Um, that it's a whole lot easier to manage the plethora of non-English language ballots. Uh, there would be potential support for more complex election systems such as instant runoff voting, fast reporting of results, lower cost. And this, was, this appeared to be a, a, a sea change and an important technological uh, improvement in the management of elections. It was honestly believed by all parties to be so in the early part of last decade. Um, what actually happened was this, I think, uh, and of course you're getting my opinion here, but I think it did not turn, to, turn out to be clean, reliable, efficient, or secure. The results are certainly not uncontestable. There's been no diminishment of election uh, contests or disputes uh, in the, since the advent of this. The results are not reported any faster than, uh, than they were before, and the costs are certainly not much lower. And there are other problems as well that I will get to. All right. Um, I want to talk to you now about, uh, just as an illustration before we get to the subject of Internet voting, which is the, let me say, this year's uh, major issue in uh, voting technology. Uh, but I want to give you some of the experience that we had in the last decade from, say, 2004 to 2008 um, in struggling by we, I'm talking about the the dozen or, or 20 uh, computer scientists in the United States who are steeped in the security issues of electronic voting, um, the stories that we have gathered and the battles that we have fought and uh, about this issue, just with electronic voting in precincts. So here's the first story. This is in Broward County, Florida in 2004, and this has come to be known as the counting backward uh, story because the election officials and the uh, press um, saw the behavior of voting machine, this particular voting machine as counting backwards. The voting machine in question was a high-speed scanner made by ESNS, uh, and uh, what they saw was that the scanner's output, as it counted batch after batch after batch of voters, it would uh, votes, it would add, add more uh, to the sum of ballots counted or, oops, sorry, and uh, you can see you know, the count would get up to 31,975, then get up to 32,000 and something, and then suddenly it would go deeply negative and then continue counting up, except they saw it as counting down because they kind of ignored the negative sign because no such thing as a negative number of votes. So it was the election officials interpreted that as counting up and then counting back down. I don't have to tell this audience what happened. This is just a dumb, unchecked 16-bit overflow bug. But it took years to fix that bug. Why? 
because the software has to be certified. And any change in election system software has to go through an elaborate national and state certification effort, which generally takes over a year and $100,000. So instead, for a long time, there were workarounds published to, to get around this. Basically, no, no collection of batches should, should, encounter, should encounter more than 32,000 votes, um, or you'll see this behavior. Um, but this is the kind of thing that happens. And, and, and election officials don't recognize it because election officials in the world are, are not all that computer literate. And while they may have some IT staff, uh, the IT staff is also um, not, the, not the kind that you are used to. Okay? They, their training is not at the level that, you are, that you're used to in most counties in the United States. There are a few counties, of course, that have um, really high quality uh, staff, but most can't afford it. San Joaquin County, California, just over the hill here uh, in, in 2005. This is a, a bug that I investigated at, at some length. Here the problem was that uh, voters would come up to a touchscreen machine and uh, every once in a while um, the machine would crash um, for reasons unknown, just as the voter was about to clear to, to, to cast the vote. So uh, the voter would see this final screen saying click below to cast your vote. They would touch that button and boom, the system would crash. You wouldn't necessarily know whether the vote had been counted or wouldn't. Diebold had a heck of a time figuring out what was wrong with this. Uh, in the end, what was discovered is, all right, this touch screen interface was, was made from a, uh, from a, a web interface with, which was intended to be used with a mouse. Of course, the mouse supports dragging operations, but touch screens don't support dragging operations. Every once in a while, at, at least in the code base that they were using. Um, every once in a while, however, a voter would touch on that red uh, cast your vote button, but do it sloppily and pull it down and drag it down to this white bar. That would cause an exception and that's what crashed the machine. Um, it, 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 did a, it was a stack corruption thing. But only like one out of a thousand voters did this. And so testing took forever to find it. In the meantime, thousands of voting machines all over the United States, because this is a widely used machine, would crash. But of course, there was no statistics on this because it's 3,000 different counties in the United States. They don't talk to each other, so it was a, this was an incredibly difficult uh, bug to find, and a serious one, because it causes crashes, and you don't know whether to allow the voter to vote on another machine or to tell him, sorry, go away. New Jersey, 2008. This is a case where the ballots were not even counted properly. Uh, this is the Sequoia Advantage machine that uh, had the, this particular bug. This was the presidential primary in New Jersey. Over here, you will see the votes counted for the Democratic candidates for president and the Republican candidates for president in this one jurisdiction. Um, and over on the right hand, a separate count of the number of Democratic ballots cast and the number of Republican ballots cast. You will note that there is one more Democratic ballot cast than the sum of the number of votes for Democratic presidential candidates. Not a problem because some voter might not have to vote for a presidential candidate in that election. However, there is one more vote for a Republican candidate than there were total Republican voters allowed in that uh, voting on uh, in that uh, precinct. What actually happened was that one voter was, for for purposes of one path in the software, uh, counted as a Democrat, and for purposes of another uh, path, was counted as a Republican. This was a mis a miscount. This was a bug in the procedures that the precinct workers were to use to set up those machines in a primary election. Um, this uh, came from uh, Professor Ed Felton at Princeton, who, was, who investigated this. Uh, Florida uh, Congressional District 13, Sarasota County, 2006. Very uh, important mystery. Uh, this particular congressional district crosses, crosses five counties um, in Florida, but only one of the counties was affected by this problem, Sarasota County. Sarasota County is a relatively Democratic county. The other four counties are relatively Republican counties. That made a difference in this case. Uh, this is a picture of the ESNS Ivotronic machine that was 
uh, in use in Sarasota County that uh, election. And what happened was this was the single hottest congressional election in the United States that year. It happened to be a seat being vacated by Catherine Harris, the famous Catherine Harris, uh, who was running for the U.S. Senate, so she was vacating her House seat. Um, Republican and Democrat uh, Vern Buchanan and Christine Jennings were the candidates. Um, at the end of the day, uh, Mr. Buchanan won the election by 369 votes out of 280, 238,000 cast. However, in Sarasota County only of the five counties, 18,000 voters failed to vote in that race at all, in spite of the fact that it was the hottest election in the United States as measured by uh, m money spent. Um, had those votes been recorded, and if they had split the same way they did in the rest of Sarasota County that votes uh, that, that, that were cast, Christine Jennings would have been sitting in Congress instead of Vern Buchanan. Um, so here is a case where uh, an arguably an electronic voting issue uh, changed the result of a congressional election. Now, I want to make it clear, the software in use in this issue was investigated uh, 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 in great detail by people that I have great confidence in. No one found any bug or any malicious code that could be responsible for that problem. And so I don't think that this was a software uh, error, even though that it really looks, looks suspicious. Uh, here are the election returns, by the way. You'll see in the United States Senator's race there was 1.1% of the people who failed to vote. In the governor's race, there were 1.3% of the people who failed to vote, but in the congressional race, 129 failed to vote. I mean, that's way out, out of scale. That's how we know that this is. And by the way, in the other four counties in that election, uh, nowhere near 12.9% have failed to vote. So we know this is anomalous. Anyway, I, I, I don't want to spend my time on explaining what I think the problem was here, except to say that I think it was a ballot layout problem. I think this was a case where voters could not learn, couldn't ver visually parse the ballot fast enough to see what happened. And I'll be glad in the question period or later to go over that if you want to see why I think so. Leon County, Florida, 2005, the famous Hursty hack. Um, this involved uh, um, Debolt AVOS machines. Um, these are optical scan machines. They happen to have a, a PCM-CIA card slot here uh, for holding memory, and that 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 card slot is supposed that, that card is supposed to hold the election description, the candidates, the offices, the precinct number, that kind of thing, and also the voted the the um, a record of the votes as they are cast and and the, the counts of those votes. Uh, so. Um, what Harry Hursty discovered um, is that uh, they also hold uh, code. They hold bytecode scripts that were used to uh, customize report generation, and they have to be customized because these are used in many different states, and states have different laws and so on. And so, um, but 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 they hold code. And what he was able to do is to take one of those memory cards and with a third party uh, writer for that kind of card, he was able to modify, to, to reverse engineer that script and modify it to cause, in effect, a transfer of votes from one candidate to another simply by modifying the memory card, never touching the voting machine. It was not a disclose, it was never disclosed publicly that these memory cards had code on them, but they did. And uh, he, was, uh, he demonstrated his ability to do this in the climactic scene of an Emmy-nominated Emmy documentary called Hacking Democracy, which I recommend to you. It was a remarkable demonstration of how he was able to uh, show that just by touching a memory card, never getting near the voting machine, you are able to uh, hack that election. The last example I want to give is from... Uh, well, I'm calling it Emory County, uh, Utah, and Princeton, New Jersey. This was uh, a case where we discovered that it was possible to infect voting machines by a virus. Now, of course, these are not PCs. They are, these are custom architectures, but still it was possible to create a virus, uh, a viral attack on them. 
Um, this is a picture of Harry Hursty, uh, by now a very famous uh, man. He's a, a first-class hacker and has devoted a lot of his life to hacking voting systems. He's Finnish, but he, he works in, in the United States. Uh, and um, what he did was, uh, in, on, on uh, Diebold TSX machines, the touchscreen machines, not the optical scan machines this time, he discovered that those same memory cards uh, that, you, that if you put a bootloader or a copy of the operating system or a copy of the voting application on that memory card and then put the memory card into the machine as you normally would, uh, the internal uh, copies of the bootloader operating system and or voting application are silently overwritten by the copy on the card. Okay? Now, if you hear that, the first thing that, you, that should come to your mind and the first thing that came to my mind was virus. Because, of course, you can, you can create a modified version of the code, silently inject it into one voting machine. Sometime later, somebody puts a different memory card into that machine, and that card is then transferred to another machine and can affect that machine and so on. So by the casual exchange of memory cards uh, among these voting machines, you can get a viral transmission of... Uh, of malicious code in voting systems. Now, this attack was actually demonstrated by, uh, um, by Ed Felton at Princeton and his colleagues. Um, and uh, so this is, this is not just uh, a, a fantasy. This was actually demonstrated in laboratory conditions. I hesitate to say, I mean, I hasten to say, we have never seen an actual, we've never documented a real uh, hack attack on a precinct election in a real, uh, in a real context. Um, the ones that we've been able to document are in laboratory context, but because of the importance of conducting secure elections, uh, we, we go to all this trouble. Um, so this is, this is uh, just a picture of the machine uh, in question, and it's used in uh, California, and actually it's actually used in a lot of places in the United States. And here is the viral attack. The, the Debolt and most election officials were under the impression that it was, impo you know, it's impossible to conduct a virus attack on, on voting machines because, hey, they're not networked, guys. I mean, they're not, it's not that they're not connected to the Internet. They're not connected to any network. They're isolated in precincts, so the saying goes. And, uh, and of course, that's wrong. They are networked in the warehouse when they are initialized before an election, at least briefly, but they are also slowly sneaker network by the casual exchange of memory cards from one machine to another in the course of doing business and of running an election. So here's what we've learned about election security. Uh, over the over a course of about four years, it was possible to for the security community, the independent security community, to conduct studies, various studies of um, voting systems in various locations. It, it either takes a court order or it takes the highest election official in a state to threaten to withdraw certification if the vendors don't submit to this um, because this, all, of course, this is all vendor proprietary software. They don't just make it available for the security community to study and cause trouble for them uh, if, they, if they can avoid it. Nonetheless, a whole large number of studies have been done and in Every case, every single case, multiple severe security vulnerabilities have been documented. I can give you URLs for these studies if you really want them. Uh, so how do we resolve the problems, uh, the, the security problems of voting systems? Well, one important uh, concept that we promote is what we call software independence. That is to say, we would like to be able to be confident that we can correctly call an election without having to trust any software. Why do we not want to trust software? Because too much is at stake, because no amount of testing can demonstrate that the software is bug-free or is, uh, is secure. Um, fortunately, in this audience, I'm sure I don't have to make that point, but in lay audiences, uh, this is a very difficult point to accept. They always think in terms of, let's just test the system and see if it works. And, and, and it's very difficult to get, to get the idea to penetrate. And the testing is not a way of demonstrating the security or correctness 
of any system, let alone a, vote, a voting system. So you want it to be the case that even if the voting system has bugs in its software, even if it has malicious code, there is another secondary way of determining that, uh, you know, what the correct outcome of the election should be and, the, and, and using that to audit the software. Um, that's where the subject of the concept of voter verified paper trails comes in. What you want is not an all electronic election. You also want at the time a vote is cast for a paper copy of that vote to be written, a copy which the voter looks at and validates as, the, as his correct intent, and you want to collect those too. Now, you may not want to use them as the primary means of counting because it's, it's slow, but you do want to be able to use it for auditing. You want to be able to take a, sa a, a sample of those ballots, hand count those, and compare to uh, machine counts of the same ballots and make sure that the, uh, that the machine counts, uh, in spite of bugs or in, and possible malicious code, are correct. And if they're not, then you want to extend your audit or you want to... Uh, do a hand count and throw away the machine counts. Um, paper is not just an old technology. It has actual security properties. It's a write once medium and it's readable and writable by both humans and machines. And it's the only medium that has those properties. So it's actually uh, uh, not a 1950s retro technology that we don't want to go back to. It's got, I think, important positive security properties that we want to take advantage of, paper. However, election officials tend to regard paper with some contempt. They do not wish to continue uh, the management of the vast amounts of paper that they have traditionally had to manage in either the punch card or the paper ballot uh, world. Um, so uh, we have the, the security community has come up with a concept called risk-limiting post-election audits in which you do something like this. You select a desired confidence level at which you would like to check that the election was correctly called. You select a sample of the paper ballots cast in that election. In a closer race, it's going to be a larger sample. In a small jurisdiction, it's going to be a larger percentage sample. You hand count that sample and compare it to the electronic counts, and if they match, you're fine. Uh, if there are sufficiently few dis distant differences, you can certify the election. If there are a number of differences that, that do not reach the 99% confidence level that you chose at the beginning, then you increase the size of the sample and you repeat until you have e can either do reach that confidence level or you've 100% counted all the paper ballots. That's the kind of process that we would like to institutionalize. We, the security community and voter and uh, verified voting, the nonprofit organization that I am the chairman of the board of, uh, that's the kind of process that we would like to institute across the United States. Yes, sir. Yes. It, uh, so the question, yeah. Um, so the question was, even with paper ballots, there will be some ballots that are uh, difficult to interpret and. Uh, isn't it always the case that there will be some elections that are too close to call? Yes, with hand-marked paper ballots, uh, it, it, there are ambiguous um, markings, and um, the, the laws in most states direct election officials to uh, be very liberal in, in, in interpreting voter intent. So if it's pretty clear what they intended, even if they didn't follow directions, they're supposed to be uh, make a... a uh, a judgment as to a uh, judgment call as to what the ballot meant, and if they can't do that, the ballot doesn't count, or at least that particular mark in that particular race doesn't count. Um, but these are, it finally boils down to human judgments in in those cases. Yes. So you, you point out that paper ballots uh, can be after the fact marked, um, you know, marks can be added to them, and uh, wouldn't it be a good idea to have some kind of checksum on them to, to catch that? Um, so there are, there are a lot of procedures um, to, to uh, 
prevent that or to detect it. Uh, they don't amount to a checksum, and they are not foolproof. You're right. Um, usually what happens is you, you know, if you, if you can add a, a vote, a mark to a paper ballot, um, you either have to add it to a, to a race that the guy didn't vote in at all, or if you do add it to a vote race that he did vote in, then you, in effect, double, double vote in that race, and that invalidates his vote in that race, and that could have been your goal, too. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's different. There's, the main guard against anything like that is what's called the two-person rule, which is, tr which is required in almost every jurisdiction in the United States, which is that no person is alone with voted ballots, or for that matter, blank ballots, but always two people are involved. So at least it takes a cons conspiracy of two people, uh, in theory, to get away with that. But you're right, you have to think about those things, even with paper ballots. But the Another big advantage of paper over electronic is that if you're going to if you're going to have an attack on electronic ballots, it can be automated. You know, in, in milliseconds, invisibly, thousands of ballots can be infected, uh, affected. Uh, that's not true with paper ballots. It takes a lot longer, and a lot more people have to be involved and have to be uh, either not looking or not paying attention. So, the I think the reduced is, the risk of that is greatly reduced with paper, but not eliminated. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, the big technology companies are not involved in this market. Uh, they are generally companies that specialize in voting systems. Uh, you're right. Do I, you asked, did I see a uh, political consequence of that fact? Uh, I don't want to speculate about that, and um, the reason is that since I write and speak about this a lot, you know, if I were to make any uh, uh, irresponsible speculative comments, you know, people would use those comments to undercut the rest of my message. So I never make comments on, on that kind of thing. Let me move on to internet voting now, because this is, you know, this is the hot topic this year. It's, it, it, it comes in waves every two or four years, of course. Uh, I first got involved in it in 1999, 2000, when I wrote a report for the Secretary of State of California recommending against Internet voting uh, in those days. The case has only gotten much stronger since then. By Internet voting, I mean any voting system in which voted ballots are transmitted over the public Internet. And sometimes we include fax and telephone and other telecom-based or mixed systems as well. Uh, but if voted ballots are transmitted, electronically over a network. I call that internet voting. Now, there are lots of internet voting architectures. There, there are various client types, personal PCs and mobile devices or secured kiosks controlled by election officials, various protocols. There's uh, web application voting, email voting, some kind of election-specific voting protocol. The ballot itself can be represented in many ways. You, commonly, it's PDFs. Sometimes it's XML. Sometimes it's some special other special purpose representation there are various authentication mechanisms and there are various other issues in the architecture of uh, internet voting systems I'm going to make comments that are generic to all of them because uh, they have enough in common that you can say a lot about them generically first let me note that in the United States in 2010 there are a lot of states that allow some form of internet voting at least by Americans who live overseas or are in the military. And that's uh, what this map describes. Um, if you look at, the, uh, at Colorado and West Virginia that have the orange color, they actually, used, uh, they actually uh, tried um, web application voting in this last election, and, uh, and so uh, got a lot of attention for that. Um, I'll come back to... But most of the states that allow inter the Internet voting of any kind typically allow email voting. And uh, in my opinion, that is the worst of all forms of voting invented from a security point of view, and I'll make that case in a minute. All right. Fundamental problems with Internet voting that really are generic to all of the architectures. First of all, Internet voting is a kind of electronic voting, and it inherits all of the security vulnerabilities of electronic voting. It's as though you took one of those electronic voting machines, opened it up, took one of its data paths, and stretched it across the entire Internet. 
uh, creating an attack service that is as big as the internet. Um, but in addition, uh, internet voting systems can be attacked by anyone on earth. That's not true for a, a precinct-based electronic voting system. But insiders and disaffected individuals from Bulgaria and foreign criminal syndicates from Russia and nation state agencies from Iran and China or anywhere else can attack a U.S. election. And they can do so from the safety of their own soil and out of reach of United States uh, law. Any number of attacks can be conducted simultaneously, independently, without knowledge of each other, either possibly interfering with each other, who knows? It's a completely uncontrolled environment when, uh, when the internet is involved. Um, many of the attacks in question are silent and they are uncorrectable and not even detectable. Certainly privacy violations, if, if, I, if I collect all the votes and publish on the, on the internet how you guys all voted, uh, you're not going to be able to correct that. And uh, if, I, if I do some other kind of attack to the votes, before they arrive at the election server, either in your client or, uh, or um, as, uh, in transit, uh, the election officials are not even going to detect that, let alone be able to correct it. The Internet, of course, the threat environment is constantly changing, and as a result, an Internet voting system, unlike a classic electronic voting system, isn't even a closed system. It changes every two years, every election cycle. You know, the, the browsers change, the uh, PDF changes, or the PDF renderers change, uh, the, the, the crypto systems change. Uh, you guys know all of this, of course, but the election officials of the world typically don't understand this at all. And so the idea that you can freeze a voting system and then certify it and then use it safely for many years, while that idea is at least conceptually might work for a closed electronic voting system, it doesn't work at all in the Internet voting world. No, electronic, no Internet voting system has been used in the United States twice. Every instance, and there have been a dozen or 15 in the last decade, have been one-offs. And I predict that that will remain true because the environment changes that quickly. All right, here's a genetic internet voting system, generic one, sorry. Uh, the purple up above, that's the vendor development network. The vendor transmits uh, his code to the county that is running the election. Um, uh, and uh, if you want to have it, a, a, and so these are the county servers, this is the uh, internet itself. These are the various voter clients where voters are voting from, let's say, private PCs or, or wireless uh, clients. And uh, if you want to attack an internet election, you have abundant opportunities to attack it. You can, of course, attack the server side, that's to say the vendor side. You can attack the vendor's code uh, in development and insert malicious code in principle. We have no examples that this has ever happened, mind you, but, this is, uh, but uh, I don't have to tell Google about the threat of external attacks to your own internal development efforts. I do use you as an example to try to explain to election officials that the little vendors who are trying to sell them these systems are not more secure than, from this kind of attack than Google is. Uh, if you want to attack an internet elect election, you can attack the server side. You can have a penetration attack on that server. You can attack, uh, there are many kinds of networks attacks that you might uh, uh, um, engage in while the while either the blank ballots are being transmitted to the voters or the uh, voted ballots are being transmitted back. Or, of course, you can attack the clients themselves with some kind of malicious uh, software attack or other uh, attack on clients. The, the number of attacks in Legion here is a list of, of attacks that, that we have uh, uh, identified in one or another publication, but to... to People who, who understand the architecture of PCs and of the Internet, uh, this category of attacks is all pretty obvious, um, except perhaps presentation attacks and vote privacy attacks, which are more specific to election. But the others of these are uh, classic um, kinds of attacks that, uh, you know, at least in this audience, you would all be familiar with, so I don't need to dwell on this too much. Now, I said I made this offhand remark earlier that email voting is, in my mind, the worst 
uh, form of voting there is because, of course, it is an Internet voting architecture, so it's subject to all of those kinds of attacks on the previous page and all the general issues that I brought up. But, in, but, but worse, at least with email voting, you know, voters and election officials, they don't have support for encrypted and authenticated email. So in email voting, your ballot is sent in the clear over the Internet along with your name because, of course, since it's a remote ballot, they have to know who has voted as well as how you voted so they can check you off to prevent you from voting twice. So with, with email voting, you transmit both your name and your email address and the ballot all in the clear. Um, so there's nothing to prevent somebody from modifying in transit or throwing it away or forging your ballot. Or uh, I mean, there's just really nothing. Um, I mentioned uh, because your name must be transmitted in the clear, uh, you are subject to vote coercion. You're subject. Uh, the the system is subject to vote buying and selling. Um, it's uh, it's a nightmare if you're concerned about those issues, which I at least am. Uh, anyone, any administrator who operates either a mail forwarding server or a router or some firewall anywhere in the path from somebody voting in Japan in a U.S. election, all, anywhere in that path from there to his county election server uh, can, uh, can trap that ballot, modify it, send it on, or throw it away. Uh, you guys know that. But um, a lot of the people who talk about Internet voting systems don't understand enough about uh, the architecture and the limitations of Internet transactions, don't, don't understand this. Other problems are that email addresses uh, are frequently shared among people in a household. They're changed frequently, so email address lists go out of date, et cetera. It's just, and it's not really intended to be a reliable communication medium. You know that email is occasionally delayed, sometimes by days. Uh, it can be duplicated. It can be lost in transit. It's, it's not a high assurance communication medium. It's not the kind of medium that you want to rest a national security uh, um, activity upon. All right. Now, yes. Yes. Okay, so let me. So the question was: She notes that uh, Oregon is uh, is entirely vote by mail. Um, Washington State is moving in that direction. California is 40 percent vote by mail, um, and of course, uh, paper mail uh, is is transmitted hand to hand and subject to delays, just as I criticized email for. Um, so, am I saying that email is? Uh, is less secure than vote by than vote by mail, and yes, I am. And the reason is, uh, while you're right, all those things are true of paper mail. You really have a hard time conducting an automated attack, a remote attack, against uh, paper transmitted in the mail. Um, so, because of the ability to automate it and the ability to conduct the attack from Tibet. Um, Oregon voters who vote by, by email are, are, in principle, much more vulnerable to manipulation than uh, who vote by paper mail. But otherwise, you're correct. Yes? No, go ahead. So he asked, do I think that the problem uh, with email voting could be addressed um, if there were a public key infrastructure in which voters got public keys at the time of registration? Okay, one time, one time pads, sorry, at, uh, uh, at the time of registration, uh, voter registration. And I guess my concern about this is, uh, no, voters don't understand key management. They don't understand the necessity of keys. They don't understand. Uh, most citizens in the United States make no deliberate use of encryption whatsoever. They, uh, it works for an HTTPS communication because the voter has to, doesn't have to do anything to make that work. It wouldn't work with email. 
So I would say no, that this is outside of what most voters are going to be capable of handling. That would be my guess. Remember, voters register possibly only once in their life, and then that, that same key would be used, what, for every election for the next 30 years for that voter? Go ahead. Well, so pe people have talked about many ways of delivering software to voters for use in elections. Um, right now, we have no infrastructure for doing that. That software itself would have to be certified. You would have to trust that software. All of the problems with electronic voting and certification and trust of that software would arise. You would have to worry also about uh, malicious software that looked like that software circulating and p having people use the wrong software. So I would say, as best I understand it now, and as best the security understands it now, the security community understands it, I would say that problem is, would be unmanageable. Did you have one more follow-up there? Yeah. Right. So uh, she she says that um, uh, the government, of course, is encouraging uh, people to to do important transactions like filing their taxes online, and um, people do that, and it appears to be safe. Uh, people also, you know, do high value financial transactions like paying multi thousand dollar mortgages a month online, and that appears to be safe. And so, uh, how do we compare that to the possibility of voting? Why isn't voting? Uh, look like that. And there are several levels of answer to that. Um, but it's a really good and important question, so I'm glad you asked it. Um, number one is um, financial transactions online are actually nowhere near as safe as people generally believe they are. And there are now special purpose uh, um, uh, botnets whose job it is to infect computers and uh, uh, e either business computers or personal computers and uh, detect when they are connecting to their bank and steal their credentials and move money. And um, there's, no, there's nothing to prevent that from happening in the online world as well. Uh, and sorry, in the online voting world as well. Uh, so I think people overestimate the security of, um, of financial transactions and transactions like tax filing. Now, the, the main security issue in tax filing is authentication, uh, privacy, and integrity. But they don't have the other dozen or so um, uh, requirements that I put up at the beginning. They are not, for example, required to be um, observable by everybody in the country and be able to uh, and be checked. And a, 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 a financial transaction and, uh, and a, uh, let's say, a tax filing transaction is a private two-party transaction. But an election, even a single vote, is not a private act between you and the election official. Um, there, the structure, the security structure of an election problem is, is really different. I care just as much about your vote as I do my own. If you and I are going to vote the same way, then it does as much damage to me if your vote is, is changed as if mine is. Or if I know you and I are going to vote oppositely, then it does as much good for me if your vote is damaged uh, as it is if I get to vote twice or something like that. That's not a, that property doesn't, that collective property does not apply in the world of financial transactions. If, if you lose $100 in, an elect, in a financial transaction, it's no skin off of my back. Okay, but that's not true in an election. Your vote weighs as much as mine and is symmetric to mine in a collective transaction in an election, not in the financial world. Got yeah, I'm going to. Yeah, let's take the, let's take this offline. Uh, just noting that she that she questions whether that what I said uh, applies at least in the tax case, um, and I'll I'll come back to that offline. Let me finish. I want to tell you the a final story here, which is a really fascinating story, and uh, it's the one that I want to leave you with. 
Internet voting has been around for a decade. It comes and goes. It's, been tri it's never been institutionalized. It's been on a trial basis over and over in the United States. But the, in spite of the security community's many complaints about the danger of this, we have never had an opportunity to actually demonstrate it until last October. The District of Columbia was preparing for the general election held last November, and they wanted to offer Internet voting to overseas and military citizens of the district to vote in the general election. What they uh, decided to do was to have developed for them an Internet voting system. Uh, it was a virgin Internet voting system, a web application. It was never tested by anyone on Earth except its developers uh, and, was, and was to be used one time in a mock voting testing environment uh, in which a mock election was held on the Internet and, and it was allowed to be attacked by anyone for at least a few days uh, in, a, in a testing period five weeks before the election. And the idea was that if it survived that test period, it was going to be used in the actual general election November 2nd. Um, the system, by the way, was actually built by people here in the Bay Area. Uh, the open source OSDV is the name of the uh, company. Um, here was their advertisement for the election. Uh, it was online, and uh, over on the right there was a link to the voting application when, once it became live um, in the test period. Uh, so remember, this was a test election, but it was, if for all intents and purposes, like the real election. So the first thing that happened with, when this became live was that I discovered a horrendous bug in it. Um, the way it was supposed to work was that... Uh, the voter would, co would connect to the system, um, request the proper ballot for his precinct. That ballot would be downloaded in PDF form through this web application. Then in the web application, you would, with the mouse, mark in a PDF overlay layer uh, your choices in the election. You would then save that PDF to the desktop as a file. And then the last step would be to upload that ballot, voted ballot now, back to the server through the same web application, okay? What actually happened, though, was when the ballot got back to the server, in most cases, it was blank. No matter what you marked on it, it was blank. And the reason is that in the save step, when you save that ballot, most browsers and most PDF support in most browsers, except for Adobe's own, throws away the overlay layer leaving a blank PDF, and when you upload that, you don't know it, but you sent a, a blank ballot. If you later discover it, it's too late. You've already voted it. That's what I discovered. Now, fortunately, I discovered it during this test period, but it was astonishing to me that it even got to this level of test without this having been detected and corrected. This would have been a horrendous problem for hundreds of voters. I say hundreds out of, there were only 900 voters in the population eligible to vote in the real election. Uh, but most of them would have cast blank ballots. Now, that was just a bug, a bad one. Um, but now I want to talk to you about the most important uh, test because um, what we were really interested in doing was demonstrating the security problems in, in Internet voting elections. Now, the District of Columbia allowed that if you wanted to do a penetration test on them, you were free to do so. There, there were no, no legal consequences to that. Lots of attacks we couldn't perform. We couldn't attack the vendor. We couldn't attack the district's ISP. We couldn't attack mock voters' machines. Those would still all be illegal. But at least server penetration attacks were open to us. Um, this is University of Michigan professor Alex Halderman, who was testifying at the D.C. City Council after hacking the trial election in a way I will describe in a moment. Um, and if you have further detailed questions, please contact him at the University of Michigan. He'll be glad to talk to you. Here was the hack. The first thing they did, sitting entirely, st sitting in Michigan, remote attack only, they penetrated one of the switches in the D.C. data center uh, because it was using the default password. Okay? Uh, what do you expect? They were able, through that switch, to capture photos from the D.C. data center's own security cameras. And here are some of those photos. Uh, courtesy of Alex Halderman, you can see on the left is the, is the, uh, the 
uh, Board of Elections um, uh, vote app server in, uh, in a cage, and on the right is the door to the data center with people coming in. The next thing they did was to penetra uh, penetrate the vote collection server via a very simple uh, shell injection attack. Um, here is the code that uh, contains the vulnerability uh, that was used that day. Um, note that I've circled the name Paul Stenborn. Uh, he, his name will come up uh, in the last slide. Uh, he is the, I, I'm not sure his exact title, but basically the chief of IT in the District of Columbia, at least for the Board of Elections and Ethics, BOEE, that was conducting the election. Um, this particular line, um, you, th this runs on the server, but it is using a file name that came from the user's client machine. It, uh, the, the file name had been validated, at least the, the main part of the file name had been validated, but the extension part of the file name was not validated, so they, they injected shell code into the extension part of the name and were able, through that device, to take over control of the entire election server. At that point, they had control of the web server. So they modified it so that future mock voters who wanted to cast votes would, if they waited for 30 more seconds or 20 more seconds, I forget which, after they voted without moving, the Michigan fight song would be played to them through their browser. Um, and, and I can verify this. I saw it happen or I heard it happen. It happened in, at my house. Uh, and um, this was their signature that they had control of the server. But the election officials running the election didn't understand, they didn't, they didn't notice it for at least, and it's not clear when, but at least 24 hours, possibly 36 hours um, after this. They also replaced all of the accumulated ballots up to that point with, with fake ballots that were write-ins for movie robots. In addition, they installed a Trojan that captured all subsequent ballots most of which were blank, I might add, <laughs> uh, with the same uh, write-in ballot for um, movie robots. But that wasn't all. They also rummaged around the server, and they found a, uh, they were looking for files to see what was there, and it turns out that there were test scripts that were testing the validity of the PDF files that came in as, as votes. Uh, and one of the tests was, is it too big to be a PDF? Rejected. Is it too small to be a ballot? Rejected. Um, and, and so uh, one of the test files that they used to see if the testing, if the filter code worked, was a big file that happened to be 900 letters written to the real voters telling them what their voter ID and PIN number should be used in the November 2nd real general election. So they captured that entire file, which I will show you a picture of a little bit later. Here is, what is, is uh, Halderman testifying for the D.C. Council after that, and that box to the right that I've circled contains the, a printout of the 900 pages that were to be mailed to the real voters. Now, um, finally, it turns out that, remember, this, this mock election was open to anybody in the world to attack. We didn't know who was going to attack it. Like, if nobody had attacked it, well, then the system would have just been used in the real election, or if nobody had successfully attacked it. But in fact, there were other attackers. Um, and so uh, Halderman's team defended against those attackers by actually inserting rules into the firewall to, to exclude those people's IP addresses. And here's the clinker. Those two separate sets of attackers were from Iran, Iran, and China, uh, IP addresses in Iran and China. Now, I've made the point that this is a national security issue. Remember, this was a, a mock election held in one city, uh, un really announced only, only three days in advance. I think there would have been a lot more attackers if they had announced it a month in advance, but they really only announced the date that they were going to bring it up three days in advance, and still hackers in Iran and China, uh, we don't know if this was, you know, their first class hackers or not. We don't know who they were, so I don't want to make any more of it than there was. But these were people fooling around trying to penetrate uh, this system. Maybe other people penetrated it. We don't know. 
Now, the reaction of D.C. election officials, well, they finally did catch on that they had been, uh, that, that their network had been owned. So the first thing they did, quite properly, was to cancel at least the voted ballot return part of the Internet election for, um, for November 2nd. They still allowed, and I think this was okay, the uh, sending of blank ballots, but then voters had to print those blank ballots, mark them by hand, and mail them back. They were not transmitted back electronically. Um, yeah, retained the blank ballot distribution part. And then, of course, they vowed never to run an Internet election again until they and independent experts agreed on its security after extensive testing. Oh, wait. No, that's not what happened. They actually pledged to repeat it and be more aggressive about solving the problem in exactly the way they have chosen in the future. In fact, this is what they did. They said, in response to the hacking of the digital vote by mail public examination software, David Jefferson of Verified Voting, me, wrote, let there be no mistake about it, this is a major achievement and supports in every detail the warnings that the security community has been giving about internet voting for over a decade now. After this, there can be no doubt that the burden of proof in the argument over the security of Internet voting systems has definitely shifted to those who claim that the systems can be made secure. Of course, I thought it, had, it was always that way in the first place. Their response was, and the response was from Paul Stenbjorn, the guy whose, whose name I circled on the page that contained the bug that, that allowed the penetration. His response was, with all due respect to Mr. Jefferson, the lesson learned is not to be more timid, but more aggressive about solving the problem in exactly the way we have chosen, meaning web application-based Internet voting. At least that's what I believe he means. Our task is to continue pursuing a robust, secure digital means for overseas voters to cast their ballot rather than resorting to email or fax. Now, to give him credit, I want to make it clear he understands that email and fax are terrible means for voting, and so th their intent was to provide something less bad than that. And so, at least in that respect, they, they had he, he understood the problem uh, properly. And he goes on, as, fa as Thomas Edison famously said, etc. Uh, he, he added, the burden of proof will always rest on election officials to ensure integrity and transparency of all voting systems, but the computer science community has a heavy burden as well. The computer science community needs to understand that tooth this toothpaste is already out of the tube and no volume of warnings can put it back. Notice, toothpaste is already out of the tube even though no internet voting system has ever been used twice. Uh, and no volume of warnings from the security community can convince them otherwise. Now, I think he probably overstated it. I don't think he really believes this, but this was the response, the PR response that he gave, and this is what we face all of the time. Election officials in the United States, by and large, don't understand, oh, I've got to talk to the mic. <laughs> election, election officials in the United States, by and large, do not understand uh, computer security. They do not have uh, um, high-powered uh, uh, technical and security staffs and um, unfortunately, however, they also do not like listening to the technical community because a, a dynamic of, shall we say, I don't know, a, a, there's a difficult dynamic between the security community and election officials because they think we're trying to tell them how to do their job. Uh, they don't like the, f they don't feel we understand their job. Sometimes they feel like we're trying to cause trouble for them. Um, it's, it's not yet a healthy situation, but I still maintain that election security is a U.S. national security issue, and in any country it's a national security issue for that country, and that Internet voting is an example of something that I just, I don't see for the next decade any way of resolving all of the issues satisfactorily that will allow us to run an election safely over the Internet. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there. I don't know. i probably way over time. I don't know. But um, if you have any further questions, I'll be glad to take them. Otherwise, uh, you're, free to, you're free to go. Uh, thank you. <laughs> any more questions? Yes. Sure. So there's a lot of problems.
don't get much of an election typically anyway. So, so it's not clear that replacing a seriously broken system with a moderately broken system is a totally bad idea. I'm trying to repeat the question, and I wasn't quite sure. I'm not sure I got it all. Um, but I think I'll, I'll imply it in my answer. I'll imply it in my answer. Um, overseas citizens do have, and, and especially overseas military, have great difficulty voting. There, there are serious barriers. There is, say, a week of latency in every communication from overseas to home. And, and at the very least, you may have to request an absentee ballot get the absentee ballot returned to you, fill it out, send it back. That's at least three trans transmissions uh, across the ocean and through foreign postal systems or whatever. And that doesn't count voter registration. So you're right. There are barriers. Uh, what, what those of us who are trying to resolve this issue suggest are a, a large number of, of ameliorating um, measures that do not involve the return of voted ballots through the internet. So the security problems of the transmission of blank ballots through the internet are, uh, shall we say, considerably more manageable. Um, and so what we are encouraging uh, election officials at federal and state levels to do is to develop secure um, means of transmitting blank ballots to overseas voters. That will instantly get them the blank ballot, and then, which they will then print and mail back, but they'll be able to do that transaction in one transmission across the ocean. And then if you, if you get those ballots to them earlier, and this is a matter of state law and practice and county law and pr uh, county practice as to when absentee ballots are available for either mailing to citizens or transmitted electronically to citizens, you can extend that, that deadline or, and or allow ballots to be counted even though they are returned after election day as long as there's a timestamp on them that says they were cast. Well, that breaks your speedy results criteria. You're required to repeat the results. Uh, look, I said that uh, when I mentioned speedy results, I mentioned, first of all, uh, these were contradictory <laughs> requirements. And secondly, that's, I put that last on the list because I think it's the lowest priority. The personal opinion. Other questions? Yes, sir. Continuing on that thread, uh, you use the example of uh, uh, e-commerce type things, which have their own set of brokenness, although from a security perspective, they're in many ways similar to what you're talking about. And we collectively have decided to accept that level of brokenness and tolerance. Uh, similarly, with the e-voting thing, either increasing the e-voting or So many people make that point that um, no system is perfect. Um, there, the question is how uh, imperfect a system are you willing to accept? Um, and uh, if the alternative is that, let's say, overseas citizens don't get to vote at all or you know, can only, only vote in small numbers because their votes are it's either too much trouble for them or they, come, they arrive late and don't get counted or whatever, um, wouldn't it be better to provide them some kind of imperfect system instead of, a, of a, you know, letting the, the requirement for perfection drive this argument? Well, in my case, in my, my personal opinion is in this case, no. The argument is against Internet voting because um, in, in every election, there's usually one congressional or U.S. Senate election that's decided by only a few hundred votes. If you only have to swing a few hundred votes in a state... Um, then the place to do that would be through an Internet voting attack, I think. Um, remember, anyone on Earth, not even U.S. citizens, but foreigners can attack U.S. elections this way. Uh, I just don't want to take a risk that, um, that, let's say, 5 million votes cast by citizens, uh, either temporarily or permanently residing overseas, uh, become the prime target for election manipulation in the United States by uh, foreigners or criminals or insiders. Um, again, this is not uh, the ability to automate or 
or attack silently and remotely doesn't apply to by mail votes. It does apply to electronic votes so, or to Internet votes. And so in my judgment, at least at the, for, for federal elections, presidential electors, United States senators, United States congressmen, um, that's too high a risk to take for my, for my view. And I, I, if I thought that it was possible to confine Internet voting only to overseas military, and I, this is being videoed, and so people out there are going to see this video and are going to hear me say this, and I, I'm going to regret saying this, I know. But if I thought it was possible to confine it to that small population who, who needs it the most, I, I could live with it, the risk. But I don't think it's possible to do that. I think once it's institutionalized for any small population, the large investment in servers in 3,000 jurisdictions around the United States uh, will have to be justified somehow. And confining that, uh, that, that investment for the benefit of a small fraction of people living outside the United States temporarily, uh, that investment would not be justified. You divide the number of voters by the, or divide the number of voters into the cost of that, it would be hundreds of dollars per vote per election as opposed to a couple of dollars per vote for election for the rest of us. So what would end up happening is that there would be more and more pressure to allow larger and larger groups and eventually everybody to cast a ballot on the Internet, at which point all of these dangers become primary instead of secondary. So that's a personal opinion, but that's, that's my fear. Yeah. There are, but not everybody in the world can attack a, a precinct election. You have to actually physically be there. Okay, you have to actually touch the ballots or touch the voting machine or at least touch a memory card. Okay, you can't sit in Bulgaria and attack a, a precinct election. And of course, I'm worried a lot about, uh, about electronic voting uh, elections as well. But internet voting to me is, is a thousand times more difficult because the attack space, the attack surface, is just a thousand times greater. That's my concern. Other questions? Yes, sir. What's your opinion about the power of the which Well, people have, so he asked, what, what if voters were issued some kind of hardware device or widget, um, maybe for authentication? For, for the whole well, I mean, Well, it certainly doesn't, it does nothing to protect you from some of these kinds of attacks. It does nothing to, pro to protect the election from a denial of service attack, for example. Sure. All, right. All right, well, you say that, but that actually is, of course, the easiest attack to, to, to happen. And it's a documented attack that actually did occur in a Canadian provincial election in, 19, in 2004, I think. Um, and, uh, and it's easier every year to, to produce such attacks. And, and it's not, to, and I don't mean just, uh, I, wa I, I want to add, not, uh, selective denial of service attacks. If you know, for example, that a given region is rich in votes of the, the people you don't like, you can uh, attack uh, uh, routers or whatever along the path from them to, to the county and, and cause their votes to be, to be dropped or delayed. Um, so this is, this, that's very dangerous. So a lot of, there are a lot, and, and they don't protect anybody from penetration attacks. And they don't protect from attacks on the vendor or the builder of the, of the widget that you're talking about. So what I'm concerned about is the entire system security. And you might provide, you might come up with a hardware widget that aids in, in strong authentication or strong encryption of ballots. And I just argue that that's, you know, two of 20 major security issues. That's, that's my concern. Not to mention the issue about the distribution of the hardware devices to voters. Um, do they, are they one-time devices that they discard each election, in which case they have, do they have to get another one for every election, or do they, are they issued at registration time? Uh, what if the protocol 
world changes, you know, or all those devices. Who pays for them? Can't charge the voter. That's a poll tax. Uh, what? So there. I, I I do not see a way of enlarging that to a full system solution. I guess is what I'm saying. Thank you.